Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and in this lecture, I'm going to look at the classic Buchla low pass gate. This is traditionally the last lecture I give in my class at Georgia Tech called Analog Circuits for Music Synthesis, but if there's sufficient interest, I'll probably do more of these. Let me know what you'd like in the comments below. Here I'm showing some modern versions of the low pass gate that you can buy from Buchla.com. The full version here, the 292E, has all sorts of fancy internal control facilities available. Here's a cut down version, that's the 292H. The 292E has four low pass gates. The 29H only has two. And I should mention that these are not to scale. The 292H is actually half the height of the 292E, and that's what the H stands for, I think. Now, low pass gates can work in three different modes. There's either the low pass or filter mode, there's the gate or VCA mode, and there's also something called the combo mode that's also often called a both mode. And the thing I want to emphasize, if you get nothing else from this lecture, just know that this combo mode is not the same as taking a low pass gate with the mode set to low pass and a low pass gate with the mode set to gate and running them in series. I think a lot of people have the impression that a low pass gate has a VCF circuit followed by a VCA circuit like you would have in a traditional mini Moog style architecture and that the both mode, the combo mode, just runs one into another and then the low pass or gate modes basically select one or the other. That's not the case. As we'll see, there's one generic general circuit that the Mbukla switches in and out different parts of it to get the different modes. So, there's also a couple of low pass gates in the Buchla Music Easel. If we look up here in the upper right, you'll see that we also have these mode selection switches. Here we have gate being called voltage controlled amp, and the low pass or the filter mode is actually spelled out as low pass filter. The low pass gate is based on a solid key architecture. This is something that we've looked at previously. And in particular, we've looked at two versions of the Salen key. The Bach version is what's used in the Korg MS-20, and we've already looked at that. But the Buchla Low Pass Gate is based on the original Salen key architecture. So that's what we'll look at in this lecture. It's convenient to break out the gain in this feedback loop K separately from the original buffering to the output. Now, Generally, if you see this written in most textbooks, you'll see the K down here, but for our purposes, it's convenient to actually specifically put it in the feedback loop and take the output before that gain of K. So the cell and key filter has two capacitors and two resistors. For our purposes here, we're letting the resistors be the same. That was convenient in both the Korg MS-20 analysis that we did and also in the low-pass gate analysis that we're doing now. But there are formulas that you can go look up where these resistances are different. And then we have this complicated formula for what the quality factor Q is. Now, remember that our quality factor Q needs to be bigger than zero in order to make sense. So that puts some limitations on the amount of feedback gain indicated by K here. Now the numerator here is obviously positive. So we can just take the denominator and write bigger than zero and then find a formula that K needs to follow. It basically needs to be less than some quantity as indicated by these capacitors. There's a related formula for the Bach variation that we looked at in the case of the MS-20, but we don't really need to worry about that here. The version of the MS-20 that we looked at was based on replacing the resistors here in the Bach version with operational transconductance amplifiers. What Buchla did with the low bass gate is to take these resistors and replace them with light-dependent resistors. We shine LEDs, light-emitting diodes, on those light-dependent resistors, and when we change the amount of current going through the LEDs, we change the resistance of the LDRs. This kind of trick isn't unique to the low-pass gate. It's used in the Mutron biphase phaser pedal, and it's also used in the Univibe pedal. Now, you can take an LED and an LDR, stick them together, and wrap some electrical tape or whatever around them, 
or you can buy prepackaged combinations of LEDs and LDRs. These often go by the name Vactrol, and Vactrol is sort of a term like Kleenex or like linoleum. It's technically a brand name, but it's used often to describe such things, even when it's made by a company that's not actually using the term Vactrol. The particular magical Vactrol that Buchlo used is the VTL5C3. And here you have some curves that show how the resistance of the Vactrol drops with respect to the current going through the LED part of the Vactrol. And you have several curves here. Curve one and two are at room temperature. They're in the middle. Curve one is based on basically just turning on the Vactrol and not having it run for a while. Curves two, three, and four are based on having run the Vactrol for a while, but they're at different temperatures. So two is based on room temperature, and three and four are based on temperature extremes. They're not really that important unless you're doing a concert on Pluto or on Venus. Although whatever the first concert to be performed on Pluto or Venus are, I bet you a Buchla synth would be involved, so this isn't too far off the mark. Notice that the relationship between current and resistance is fairly complicated. So people tend not to try to calibrate this to any particular scale per se. So with something like a Moog ladder filter, people might try to tune that such that you get a one volt per active response from the filter as far as the cutoff frequency goes. With a Buchla low pass gate, you just kind of get what you get. One of the really cool things about using Vactrols is they don't respond right away. And the speed with which they respond depends on a lot of different factors. And in particular, they tend to open up faster than they close. When you close a low-pass gate, when you basically take the control and you shut it off suddenly, you can get this cool kind of ringing effect where the Vactrol is trying to catch up. Now, some people have the impression that's because the LED itself is slow. It's not. You can control the perceived brightness of an LED using pulse width modulation, but that's only because of your persistence of vision. The LED itself can turn on and off very, very fast. The slowness that we have here arises from the characteristics of the light-dependent resistor. Here's a snippet of the Buchla 292C version of the low-pass gate, and this is actually a slightly tweaked variation created by Mark Verbos. Mark is one of the most well-known scholars of Buchla Esoterica. He has a blog called Buchla Tech. I don't think he's posted to that in a while, but it's pretty cool. It's worth checking out. And he also has his own company, Verbos Electronics, that makes Buchla-inspired Eurorack modules. So in the upper left-hand corner, you see a little bit of the circuitry that generates the current for the light-emitting diode. I'm not going to worry about the details of that here. Then the rest of this, we have the signal coming in over here. We have the signal coming out over here. We have various mode switching mechanisms down here. And essentially, this is all creating voltages that control these electronic CMOS switches. When people build their own versions of this, they'll often replace these with just mechanical switches. I should also note that the Q here stands for quiet ground. So these are all signal grounds. Now, Buchla schematics can be difficult to interpret in general. And the way this particular schematic is drawn makes it particularly difficult to see the underlying solid key structure. So I've redrawn the main elements here. The dotted lines indicate paths that are switched in and out depending on the particular mode. So we have a low-pass path and two separate gate paths. The 4.7 mega-ohm resistor here isn't doing very much that's interesting. Basically, it's there to make sure that we can bleed off any extra charge stored on this 910 picofarad capacitor in the case where the vector resistances are so high that they're basically open circuits. Now, of course, we only need to worry about that when the gate connection here isn't being made, because otherwise we could rely on this 10K resistor. So for most of what follows, I'm just going to ignore this 4.7 mega ohm resistor. The one microfarad capacitor here is basically just a DC block. 
And it's a bad idea just to leave the input of an op amp hanging if you're not plugging anything into it. So for that purpose, we have this 100K resistor here. And the 100K resistor here ensures that we don't get any weird pops if we suddenly plug something into it. If we were to assume that this op amp was ideal, this overall circuit would have a 1K output impedance, and that's a good choice for short circuit protection on the output. As far as the input goes, if we ignore this cap, basically we see 100K and 100K in parallel, so we have a 50K ohm input impedance. Now, as far as this op amp goes, if the gate connection here isn't being made, this 15K is out of the circuit, and we have this 15K in the feedback loop, but it's not really relevant. It might as well just be a straight line here. And so this is just a voltage buffer. First, we'll look at the filter, AKA low pass mode. In that mode, this low pass path is connected, but the gate paths are disconnected. If I take that and simplify the resulting schematic, starting with this point here and treating that as our input, we get something that looks like this. And this is almost a Salen key filter. And I could apply all of our Salen key formulas to it that we've looked at so far if I were to ignore this 220 picofarad capacitor. And is it valid to do that? Well, probably not. To analyze the circuit properly, you would have to work out the transfer function, including this capacitor. And if I was going to write some sort of DSP plugin, like an audio unit or VST plugin for a digital audio workstation, well, then you would want to model all of this in detail. But here, I just want to get a feel for how the circuit operates. So I'm going to blatantly disregard that 220 picofarad capacitor. Sorry about that small capacitor. Because if I do that, well, this is just a solid key. And if I plug in the values for the natural frequency, I can sort of see what this looks like for a few values of R. Now, I picked a few values from this particular plot because they landed on grid lines that were easy to see. I used plot number two when choosing some particular values. I first started with 0.2 milliamps basically 200 microamps. That gave me an R of 700 kilo ohms, and plugging that into my formula for FN gave me an FN of 110 hertz. I also tried three milliamps, which corresponds to 10 kilo ohms on that chart, and plugging that in gives me an FN of 7.6 kilohertz. I also tried six milliamps, which corresponds to an R of 5 kilo ohms, which gave me an FN of 15.2 kilohertz. So by changing the current over a reasonable range, I get a nice spread of natural frequencies. I can also ask, what is Q, the quality factor of this filter? Now, when people build their own versions of this, they will often modify Buchla's original design to make this K and hence the Q variable, either by a control voltage or just by a knob. But if we use Buchla's original design, we set K equal to one, so that second term in the denominator drops out, and we can simplify the expression to be one half of the square root of the feedback capacitance over that capacitance to ground, and plugging in the particular numbers for this particular design, we get a Q of 1.13 something something something. So we do get a resonance bump out of this filter. It's not a very big resonance bump. So Buchler low pass gates are not the things that you turn to when you want a big resonant Moog style filter sweep. Next, we'll take a look at the gate mode, also known as the VCA mode. This is a voltage-controlled amplifier kind of mode. So in gate mode, the gate paths are connected, as you might expect, but the low pass path is disconnected. So simplifying the schematic under those conditions, and also assuming that VN is being provided by an ideal voltage source, so I could just copy VN over here at the positive terminal of the op amp, I get something that looks like this. So in this particular case, this structure in front here is a non-inverting amplifier configuration that gives me a gain of two. 
My guess is that Don Buchla figured out that he needed to put this in here to sort of overall balance the levels between the various modes of the filter so that the musician doesn't feel that things are jarring when switching between modes. That's just a guess. As I did with the filter mode, I'm going to cheat a bit and assume that this 220 picofarad capacitor isn't there. I'm going to assume that some other effects in the circuit are dominant. And again, I'm just trying to get an overall feel for how the circuit works. If you're trying to make some sort of emulation of this for your computer, you would want to go back and model this in more detail. So if we take out that particular capacitor, we get something that looks like this. And notice if I didn't have the 910 picofarad capacitor here, this is just a voltage divider with resistors. Very standard and what you might expect for something like a voltage controlled amplifier. So let's approach it from that standpoint and imagine that this 910 picofarad capacitor is just a nuisance that's kind of tagging along. If we take a look at this, we could treat this whole thing as an RC filter with non-unity gain at DC. For the rest of the analysis here, this gain of two out in front isn't very important. So I'm just going to do the rest of the analysis based on the voltage at this point, at the output of this op amp, and I'll call that VN prime. You can go back and stick the two on everything later. Anyway, the gain at DC is given by just assuming that this is an open circuit. And in that case, I just have my usual voltage divider formula. So thinking through this a bit, Notice that the gain drops as the resistance R rises, meaning that the gain drops as the control current drops, or equivalently, you could say that the gain rises as the control current rises. And that's nice because it matches up with the overall behavior of the OTA-based voltage control amplifiers that we looked at previously. But these particular voltage controlled amplifiers that we're getting from Buchlo land, these aren't necessarily ones that have a linear control scheme or an exponential control scheme. You just kind of get whatever you get. Now, what about the cutoff frequency of this RC filter? Well, the half power cutoff point relative to whatever the gain at DC is, is given by this formula. And this looks like one over two pi RC in your usual RC filter formula, except here, instead of just an R, we've put down the parallel combination of these R's in series with this 10K. That comes from imagining thinking about writing down a Thevenin equivalent circuit looking this direction. So you would write down a voltage source that would be Vn prime times this particular factor here. And then when you compute the Thevenin resistance, well, you imagine essentially shorting this voltage source Vn, and you would get that parallel combination. So let's see what these formulas give us for some specific numbers. If I try R equal 10 kilo ohm, that gives me a gain of one third. If I were to try, say, an R of 5 kilo ohm, that gives me a gain of a half. And if I ask what the corner frequencies are for those particular cases, well, in the first case, I get 26 kilohertz. And in the second case, I actually get 35 kilohertz. So as the gain at DC is going up, this corner frequency is also going up. And even down at one third, a gain of one third at DC, I'm still having a cutoff frequency that's well above the range of human hearing. Now, of course, for very low gains, this FC is in fact going to be lower, but at those low gains, you're not really hearing anything anyway. So that 910 picofarad capacitor isn't really serving any musical purpose. And I would conjecture that ideally it wouldn't be there, but that Don figured out that the effect of having this capacitor in here in this particular mode was so insignificant that it wasn't worth putting in another CMOS switch in order to switch it out. So finally, we'll take a look at the combo mode, also known as both mode. Although, as I mentioned before, this is not a very accurate name for this particular mode because it is not at all like an actual combination of the filter mode and the VCA mode. So in the combo mode, 
None of these paths are connected. They're all disconnected. And if we do that, we wind up with a circuit that looks something like this. So this is a two-pole passive RC filter. Its poles are going to be spread out along the real axis. So not only will you not have a resonance bump, this is going to have a fairly gentle slope. And notice that very much unlike in the gate mode, this is going to have a gain of 1 at DC, just as in the case of the filter mode. Oh, and one brief aside that I should have mentioned earlier, the 10K resistance in the feedback path here, that's dealing with non-ideal op-amp effects from the chips that Don Buchla had available at the time. If you're using a modern JFET input, op amp like a TLO 70 whatever or TLO 80 whatever, you could just make this be a straight line and be happy. The Bukla 360 programmable octal signal source has a low pass gate for all of its eight signal sources and the low pass gates on the 360 do have an additional mode in which all of these paths are connected. It's called the compensated mode but the 360 is the only Buchla that I know of where that's available. I should also mention that I've been showing the 292C schematic the whole time, but of course there's variations of it. Whatever the low pass gate circuit in the 360 is, or the music easel, or other versions of the 292, those are all gonna be a little bit different. So you may have noticed that I've done a lot of hand waving in this lecture. My main goal was to try to get an overall feel for how the circuit operates. If you want to know the real deal, I strongly recommend checking out this paper, A Digital Model of the Buclo Low Pass Gate by Julian Parker and Stefano D'Angelo. And it was published in DAFX. And so these papers in DAFX are usually focused on building digital emulations, but they're usually the best place to go to to get an understanding of the underlying analog circuitry. So strongly recommend checking this paper out.